that's, that's right. That's just. Okay, well, here's that, here's that DC-3 that peeled off. Yeah, I wonder why they peeled off. And he's flying over the field. In way, yeah, I still see the formation of circling the airfield way, way, way to our, believe it, I believe that's south in that direction. Wait a second. He has an engine out. Does he really? His left prop isn't moving. Left prop is not moving? Left prop is not moving. Okay. He's got a feather, just like we learned. Yeah, see, there you go. Okay. You can actually see that. Yeah. Chad, do you all see that? Do you see how the prop doesn't seem feathered, to be spinning. It's feathered forward too, so it's straight on. It's, it's not just on. a okay. camera artifact. You know how the frame rate matches the, yeah, the rotational right speed. So I can see the right one. Wow. Perfect, I mean. Now it's worth noting, chat, they can do this. Yeah. yeah this <laughs> the plane is designed, designed to fly this way. When we sat in the cockpit of yep. the DC-3 yesterday, uh, John Sessions plane, right? Yep. Um, Gene showed us the knobs and switches that you would use to feather these props. And in fact, he told us that if there was a problem with one of the engines, one of the massive advantages that this aircraft design had was the ability to feather the prop. Because yep. if the prop is still completely sideways, like the normal prop direction that you use to pull the plane forward, that's a lot of drag. If the propeller's not actually spinning, the engine's not working, that's an awful lot of drag slowing down the plane. So what they've done is they've turned this propeller so that it's facing directly into the wind, that the blades of the propeller are right in the wind, and that gives it a lot less drag. The other engine on the plane is completely controlling the plane Right, right now. Absolutely. Wow. What, and what's interesting about this is, and I'll, you'll get all your DC-3 history today, but when they, <sighs> built the DC, when they built the DC-1, which was the first of these, it was the test plane for the right. DC-3. Look at, look at this. Right. Wow. So look he's, got, he's got quite a wind and he's going to have a whole lot of torque, torque. one engine is going and the other is not. So he's having to really compensate for the fact that yeah. that airplane wants to turn. Saber, you can see that engine stop, can't you? Yeah, you can. This is, I can't tell. What, this looks like the Norwegian one. What an opportunity to see this. Yeah, it, it is the Norwegian one. It's got the flag on the front. Yep. Look at that. But look at the control. Oh I mean, these pilots what are What a great piece of flying. So amazing. It's got the main gear down, but look at how right. high that tail yep. still is. You're just going to let the tail down, lose yep. a little bit of speed. Slowly. Yep. So when they built the DC-1, oh my one gosh. of the conditions wow. was... Charles Lindbergh was the safety expert for TWA who wanted the plane built. Yeah, look and, at that. And he said that plane needed to be taken off from the shortest field at the highest altitude with one engine. Wow. Fully loaded. So <sighs> TWA, they wanted them to prove, Douglas had to prove that that airplane on one of their two engines. On one of the two engines. Because they had always flown tri-motors. Yeah. So they always felt they had a spare engine. So when Douglas proposed one with two engines. They're like, oh. Oh yeah, no, what are you oh. gonna do? And and so the test flight for it though, they were flying the DC-1. It was Tommy Tomlinson for TWA and Ed Wells was working at the time for Douglas. Ed Wells is in the pilot seat. He's on the left-hand side. He's flying the plane. They start the roll and the guy in the co-pilot seat from TWA just kills one of the engines. <laughs> no warning, no anything. What? Now clearly you couldn't test this. There were no simulators. Yeah. You had no idea no if you were going to make it. And when they got uh, down, he's, the, the, Eddie looks at him and goes, what did you do? And he said, well, how else were we going to know if it really worked? I mean, it was, it was, oh, their, it was just their theory that you had to actually try it to see. But yeah, these planes, <laughs> yeah. That plane did exactly what it was supposed to do. That was yeah. amazing. I've never seen that before. Can I look around the rest of the stuff here? Sure. I mean, what else do we have? I mean, we already found the fuel mixture. We found the throttle. What are the P's here? Uh, that, this is your propeller. Oh, okay. well, that would so, be why there's a P on yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what this airplane has, and, and this is what saved a lot of Americans during the war, Hamilton Standard designed a variable pitch propeller. Right. And what we can do, and, and Americans were before the Germans on it. The Germans had, and the British, had different designs, electrically, manually, however they wanted to do it. But it was a Hamilton Standard, an American company, that designed a way to use oil pressure up through the nose of the propeller to basically to shift change, gears, to change yeah. that pitch. To change the pitch. So yeah. that's what you can do, and that's what you do from the propeller. Okay. Now, the thing that I, I will tell you that saved the Americans is the Germans could only come back to the lowest pitch. Okay. So they could only bring them back so far. Right. So that's still creating drag. But what the Americans did is they put a pump in there. Right. That sends higher pressure oil to push the blades back to the vertical position. To vertical position. So you mean directly into the airflow or in, sideways? Into the airflow. Directly into the airflow. And then they're feathering from the rowing term. Yep. When yep. Oars come. You feather it this way, and there's very little. You get less drag. Less from. drag. You could come home on one engine. So if you had an engine that came down, you could actually feather the prop out feather using the, the oil out. pressure. Yep. 
get not very much drag from it at all because it's straight into the airflow as opposed to sideways, right? Y'all y'all yeah. understand this. We can do this in KSP. And then you could actually glide further or glide further. Well, the other or engine just use will one keep engine. you in the air. Yeah. yeah. This airplane will fly on one engine. And then you just, you have to control it. You give it rudder to correct for the pull on one side. Exactly. keep it flying sort of straight. When you land, you probably land a little bit like this, but. <laughs> uh, when you get back down into the landing part of it. Yeah. Uh, remember, if you have normally two propellers turning out there, right? that's going to help you. Now you have one not helping you. So you actually tend to land longer, you land longer. a tad faster. Okay. That's just a, as a, a You keep the airspeed up, I guess, but right? You'll keep your air, okay. Well, what we like to say is everything should remain pretty much normal. If right. you start up in the airspeed, being high, uh, doing something less, something different. You, something different, you change your profile, you right. change your technique and everything. Like to stay, let's keep everything pretty much the same as we've been doing. Look at the runway the certain way, keep the power and the speed about the certain way. <laughs> but that was, it's very important to have that. That's and and really the cool. feathering pump has its own gallon and a half right. to allow that to feather. So it doesn't it's pull up the main feed or anything like Even that? Even say, say if you lost the oil because of cylinder blew and a you know or, or a cannon went through the engine you'd still be able to feather the props so you yeah. don't get the drag so you can make it home right pretty slick <laughs> i mean you could read about this online somewhere chat or you could sit here and learn about <laughs> it 